And we are live straight from Turku. Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to our second straight webinar in our webinar series about how to run successful AI projects. Uh, this time, a bit differently than last time, we are gathered in a form of online fireside chat with amazing guests. Mika Aaltonen, Tero Ojampera and Nico Vuok. But before I introduce them to you uh, a bit better, uh, just shortly about me and today's agenda. So my name is Juha Reini. I am a member of Silo Sales and Business Development Team and I am focused in smart devices and retail and I am your host today. So uh, today's webinar is uh, part of our webinar series on smart cities where you learn such things as uh, how machine learning and computer vision improve situational awareness and topic which we actually are covering up today. Uh, but also uh, how machine learning can help us understand the future unemployment and financial stability and how logistics can be predicted more accurately with machine learning. And to sign up for these webinars as webinar series you might be interested in or to see all of them in previous recordings, you need to go to silo.ai slash webinars. So our agenda today is really tight. Uh, we have less than one hour to cover up a major topic and major issues. So let's get to know our guest today. First of all, Mika Aaltonen, my favorite, my childhood hero, but most of all, a well-known foresight researcher, chairman of AI strategy company, and of course, former football player of Inter Milan. Mika has a PhD in economics, and he is a docent in foresight research and complexity. Mika has written 15 books, and among others, he is also a member of the Royal Society of Arts. A warm welcome, Mika. Yeah, thank our, you very much. Our second guest today is Tero Ojanperä, chairman and co-founder of Silo AI and former CTO of Nokia, co-founder and chairman of Vision Plus and a passionate weightlifter, if you didn't know that. Tero has more than 20 years of experience in mobile industry and he has a PhD in electrical engineering. Tero, welcome. And last but not least, our own Nico Buoko, lead solution architect of Silo AI and general AI, machine learning, software, and cloud professional with decade of experience within various business areas. But Nico is not only an advisor, co-founder, and a mastermind behind many innovative startups, he has also been involved in the Mathematics Olympics, first as a competitor, where he actually was bronze medalist, and then as a coach of Team Finland for 10 years. Nico, welcome. Thanks. So, Hi, everyone. So today's topic, AI for social distance, distancing in a free society, can we have both? Our guests are discussing about some major big questions such as how can businesses adapt and ensure safety with the help of AI? And how to use AI and modern technologies such as computer vision to manage physical distancing and still maintain privacy? And what technical choices have been made to preserve privacy? And what is the reasoning behind this? But before we jump into this topic and tackle of these major issues, Nico, it's your turn to showcase an AI solution that helps business owners and real estate managers to ensure safety and social and physical distance in public spaces while maintaining the privacy of the people. And for the webinar audience, I would like to remind you that don't forget to use the possibility to ask questions from our speakers. You can just write your questions to the chat box on the right, and we will reserve some time in the end to answer as many of them as possible. And I am hoping for the good flow and a good speech, good talk from all our uh, uh, speakers. But now, Nico, the stage is yours, please. Um, sure. Yeah, so let's uh, go a bit forward on the slides. So basically what we're, what we're looking at currently in the society, a uh, big piece of the 
current responsibility of, of containing the epidemic has actually been pushed into consumers, simply because when, when this situation has become as a surprise to everyone in the Western world, that has been the only scalable way to really solve it. But that can't really last since consumers themselves don't have the capabilities, they don't have the information to really be able to uh, get us to a new kind of a world where we can sustainably handle new epidemics. So, so instead of individual people, we need to push the responsibility of this of these risks uh, into businesses and to the public sector. So considering that this is certainly not going to be the last epidemic of our time, uh, it really means that the epidemic risk will be becoming a part of regular risk management for all sorts of uh, uh, companies and associations. So uh, from, from there uh, becomes the question that, okay, if, if handling epidemic risks is now part of how businesses do business, then how can they actually run a business based on that assumption? So they really need to have tools and uh, they now need to have processes to systematically reduce this uh, contagion risk uh, in their premises and, and all the spaces that they control. So for that purpose, uh, to really provide these tools to, to run this kind of a process, we've been building this physical distancing analyzer, which is uh, based on computer vision. And uh, if you've been browsing the web recently, you've probably noticed uh, a wide selection of various demos where where computer vision is basically used for detecting different people on a street view or uh, within a shopping mall and then assessing what is the distance between these people and so on. So that is the way uh, of a technology demo. But what, naturally what we're here looking for is really to provide the tools for these businesses to really get new data from the situation and, and then systematically monitor and improve the situation uh, in their own business. So what we do provide with the tool is certainly not just this uh, computer vision uh, demo, which uh, as such doesn't really provide that much value overall, but instead really convert that initial analysis of image data into more detailed analysis of the physical distancing, age groups and mask use uh, in the premises and from there provide automated statistics on, on how are the spaces actually used, uh, how do things change across time, how are things different in different parts of the premises, uh, what sort of things this could be made to improve the situation. And this data can then be used to really test or, uh, and prove the impact from let's say like policy changes, space modifications and other safety efforts that the business might decide to take on. Uh, finally, naturally, once these improvements are happening, then having really tangible data on what is the present risk, uh, let's say, on a shopping mall, that is a really a strong basis for better messaging towards the mall visitors to, to really prove then that it's really safe to visit the shopping mall, whether you are in a risk group or not. So then moving forward, uh, probably by far the biggest question related to these things is really around privacy. Uh, since there's been a lot of uh, security surveillance happening in commercial spaces for a very, very long time. But every single time we start take some pre data that has been in use previously and adapt it to a new use case, there's always the question uh, how much there's uh, actually um, moving back um, actually risks of this sort of a slippery slope uh, phenomenon uh, where where suddenly something that was already deemed safe previously in terms of privacy suddenly ha ha becomes a big surprise and a risk e even if not uh, in the real world then certainly in in how people uh, feel about it so uh, to really uh, move us to a world where, uh, where we can actually systematically work on this risk, 
then the only way to succeed in that is to get the individuals, the consumers, everyone in the society, along with the right, to really accept that this is the right way to go and it's really protecting them uh, rather than uh, endangering their rights. So how, how we've been approaching this question here is, is really build the design of the solution based on a privacy threat model to understand what sort of threats could occur in this sort of a solution, really assess what is the risk and uh, in, in size and probability of this occurrences and then tackle those in the design. Then secondly, as, as you know, so EU has been increasingly adding uh, focus and guidelines on, on privacy issues, starting with the GDPR legislation and, and now also a recent AI white paper this February, which is stating the principles of deploying AI solutions in the future as well. Uh, as a fi final point on this, uh, naturally the question when, when working with uh, individuals and how, how they uh, perceive this sort of a solution being used on their data, it's also important to understand what is the social science aspect of the design to make sure that we're actually reaching the objectives and not accidentally uh, ending up in a worse situation. As specific countermeasures, then we have identifiable information taken away immediately as we are collecting data, simply anonymizing the data uh, prior to any additional data processing and, and really leaving all the anonymized data, all the identifiable data only close to the cameras and, and never, never taking it, for example, to the cloud side. And, and since this is really a the solution is really more about uh, statistics and, and following what is the general situation in the, in the spaces. It's run really about security surveillance type of monitoring by humans, but it's, it's more about taking the data, converting it into uh, totally anonymous crowd level numbers and working with those to improve. So as a brief example of, of uh, of how we've been building uh, the tools. So here's a, a snapshot of, of how, how it's working. So here we have, on the top left, we have a selection of different cameras uh, from the area, uh, which can be then uh, assessed when, when there's specific alerts happening uh, in that area. And, uh, and that is also providing areas of, of current hotspots. Then there's also current statistics of, of what is really happening in the uh, in the area, area of the camera. And on the right-hand side, we have a, more, a lot bigger map-based uh, overview of, of where are people moving and what is the physical distancing situation in those spaces. Uh, then to work on the uh, long-term statistics of, of, of improving the situation, then we also have this uh, st customizable statistics view right here on the dashboard to really analyze how things are changing as, as policies and modifications are made. But that's, that's all I had basically here. So, Juha, you can take over. So, for the presentation, uh, my first question goes straight to Mika and Tero. Uh, after seeing Nico's product demo, uh, what do you think about using these kind of technologies to let businesses restart safety after or even during the COVID-19? Nico, maybe you can start. Yeah, thank you very much, Juha, and thank you very much, Nico, for, for a great presentation. So I think that what we have experienced this, this spring is something extraordinary. This has been a jump in the dark for the Western, Western democracies and for the whole world. So, so we, can, we have only been able to count the sick and count the dead. And uh, we haven't been able to, to test enough people and we don't have a medicine for the situation. And not, the only answer has been the blind isolation of people. And I think that there's appetite in the world for any kind of solution that uh, promises to give some kind of light to this situation. And I think that this, this can be one of those solutions. Yeah, this is uh, that's a good point. Thanks, Nico. And uh, 
I think uh, everybody was hoping for the V recovery of the of the crisis, but it doesn't seem that likely that we kind of need to live with the, let's call it the new normal uh, situation that uh, the coronavirus is with us and and will be there for some time being. So we have seen that the politicians uh, they need to provide guidelines, but very often these guidelines are, are kind of generic ones that hey. There can be only 500 people in the in the stadium, regardless how big or small the stadium is. And in that sense, the, if we think about the solutions like this computer vision, uh, uh, physical distancing analyzer, it can actually provide information that uh, that how is the real situation on the field. And in this way, we hopefully could get more flexibility into the situation and, and into the rulings that we can we, we don't need to kind of have one size fits for all but but really have the flexibility yes so i agree with with Teros that it looks like that the situation will will go on like this for 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 months or maybe even for years and so going back and getting back to some kind of normality some kind of activity is very important so I think that this will not be a temporary solution only for, for this summer, but I think that these kind of solutions will be with us for, for months or maybe even years to come. Yeah, and I think the one, one element there is that uh, nobody wants that uh, the, the humans will interfere and, and start to overlook our activities. Neither we don't want a big brother mentality but it's really about the solutions that where the privacy uh, designed by privacy is the is the principle that you really take into account that you you don't need to pass the information to somebody to analyze it on an individual level that to really get the overall situation and as Nico was nicely pointing out that can be used for various purposes uh, uh, in, including kind of developing the flow of the people flow so that there are less uh, uh, less possibilities for infection and, and things like that. So I think the technology has a great opportunity, but I think at the same time we are kind of afraid of taking technology into use because uh, we don't know how it works or what would be the best way for it to work, as proven by the contact tracing apps that has been debated for months now and doesn't look like we would be getting them into use uh, that soon. Yeah, I think it's been sort of like um, when we started working on this originally we were simply thinking about the current coronavirus situation and, and think okay how, how do we get away from that how do we get past this but then after a while we actually realized that okay this is not really going away like if you just look a few decades to the past we've been actually simply lucky until now that no other epidemics have reached this scale you know, this global scale but in, in terms of simple probabilities, we, we need to prepare for a new kind of world where these things simply happen once in a while. And that's probably been more or less happening all throughout the history, but naturally the world has been, uh, ha has been less connected then as well. So it's, it's been more limited. So in a way, um, for, for me at least, it was an in interesting consideration that Right now, businesses are doing this uh, ESG reporting, whether it's governmental, social, environmental uh, responsibilities uh, of the business. But what is really the responsibility in, in managing this kind of safety in their own, own business? How, where is the uh, related regulation yeah. also going? Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. When you pinpointed the connectivity between people, which is also important when, when, when we are talking about this disease, this corona disease and the spread of it. So there's another other connectivity. So that means that when, when, when a crisis happens, and this is primary a health crisis, so the consequences will be spread all over the society. So it will be a social crisis, it will be an economic crisis, etc. And I think that the tra traditional or the current economic thinking isn't very well aware of these kind of connections. I think one element is there this uh, this uh, kind of compliance with the with the regulations and laws. Yeah. I think today you basically kind of say that if we return to the workplace, the first question is that do we have a guidance in place that uh, 
that uh, you you comply with the hand sanitation requirements, etc. So it's it's the basic level that you have certain guidelines. But I think that uh, I believe that uh, whether we like it or not, but I, I believe that the regulatory environment will be tightened up, and and you will be needed to prove different things that are you compliant, and there actually technology can help. And and but I wouldn't like to see a world where technology is used to kind of overreach, uh, if you wish, uh, that that uh, the data is being used for other purposes. And there, as Nico was showing, uh, some relatively simple technical solutions that, hey, how is the data being processed in premise or in the cloud? How do you protect the people's uh, uh, identity, etc.? I think are really critical. But I believe that this is a huge business opportunity for Finnish and other companies to take on uh, when we go forward. I'd like to uh, ask uh, about uh, Tero's point. Uh, now, how can we have both free and democratic society and at the same time use these technologies or, or can we? Is it possible? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think this, this is the major question. I think this is, this is this is the first question that we have to ask, and I think uh, I have a many years with, with, with friends with the, with the prime minister's office, and I told them that UK was democracy, and then you stopped developing it. So I think that this crisis is a major opportunity for the Western societies to rethink their democracy. So our democracy is 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 really old-fashioned is, is this kind of sympathetic elitism so that means that there's a small group of people who's making choices for the whole population and now we have all kinds of uh, possibilities technological possibilities to really remake a true democracy according to the old ideals what we have and I think that we would be foolish if we wouldn't use this crisis in remaking or improving our democracy and i think that the questions here also related to this specific case that we are talking today are related to the wider democratic environment and context in finland and in, in europe especially so this means that uh, we are developing technologies and then we are asking the very important questions that should be concerned when we are living in a democracy. And, and this is the true situation, and this is, this is a very difficult situation, as Tero remarked earlier, that uh, the, the legislation and, 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 and these kind of systems lack behind. We are already making the technological solutions, and then we are later maybe asking what, what should we do. Uh, in, in the legislatory environment, I think one one uh, uh, it's a it's a hard question, but it goes to the to the uh, the kind of the basic principles. How do you design uh, solutions? And I, I would like to use here a kind of uh, analogy to a, to a successful launch or or very successful companies that are basically. Uh, kind of kind of nations on their own if you think about google apple etc et, et amazon uh, they they are they dominate our lives but if you look at their development they have all actually launched with the very narrow solutions and simple offering they were not huge platforms in the beginning uh, facebook started from harvard amazon from bookstore and then they have expanded in a, in a similar manner, I think that the, today, when we think about these solutions like contact tracing app or this kind of a, a computer vision solution, I believe the offering should be really simple and, and narrow and not try to do everything with it uh, and, and get the momentum. And, and in that sense, the question is that, is it designed the solution with the privacy and free yeah. society in mind that, uh, or, or is it designed from some other angle? The, uh, the second point in, in the success of these companies is the community that they, like I, my favorite recently is Tesla, like how they are building the, the community around their cars and they do all the marketing. So how do we get the first 
minimum viable product out there, whether it is contact tracing app or computer vision solution for, for malls, and, and, and design it by privacy first and get the active community to kind of take it forward. And, and then we have a chance actually to, to, to kind of advocate the, the free society and, and technology together. I, I think that we are, we are already think, in a better position than, than those applications or those big companies that you, you named here. Because I think that the, the drivers for their success have been the old drivers of the, of the industrial society. That means money and politics, maybe selfism or greed. And I think that having these kind of questions and discussions that we are having now is all already a step forward. Because I think that the proposition, if it comes only from, from the money or, or from politics or greed or those kind of topics, it's an empty proposition. And I think that what we are talking here is a fuller proposition that also considers the rights of individuals. And those are the rights which, which, which we have recognized for a thousand years in Western societies. And I think that but do you, but, 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 recognized in Google and in Facebook and those, those great companies. I think it, it's quite a bit of difference with between Europe and US as well, because usually in the in the US is such that businesses are really fast. They go and do whatever feels best for the for the consumers, for the for the customers, and they don't even maybe stop about thinking about these lines in the sand. But then with small, tiny daily decisions, they inch to the wrong side of the wrong side of that line. And then the government simply follows too late to really stop them before it becomes a major major business for them. Whereas I think naturally, even in, in the EU, EU, there's been different types of guidelines provided. There's always the question that, okay, how, how do you actually enforce this kind of regulation? But at least there's a bit of more mental enforcement for every employee in every company that what is acceptable, what is not. So it's one more question they ask before they actually go and, yeah. and make that decision that then accidentally later becomes a privacy issue. But but I think the one one thing is quite interesting that um, uh, successful. So I, I'm not taking a stand with the different companies' philosophies and how they, they run their business. We just note that these are very successful companies. But but if you look at the situation now in the Europe, it's kind of interesting that. Uh, that this uh, contact uh, uh, tracing apps uh, that Apple and Google launched the framework, uh, the exposure notification API, that where you can uh, where you can uh, build an app uh, to to kind of notify if you have been exposed by another user and it's working through Bluetooth. So, to my understanding, and and I said to Titas that uh, that that. That is actually pretty privacy preserving application and uh, or, or, or a protocol. And at the same time, some of the European countries, the governments have been uh, advocating decentralized approach. The previous one was called decentralized. And, and uh, so we have an interesting debate going on. In this case, I realized that the Google and Apple are reading the situation that privacy is required by people to take this application into mass use. So they go with the customer pool and, and whether that will succeed, we'll see. But we have seen like, for example, Germany reversed their stand and adopted the Google Apple approach. And a similar way, I think that any company that is thinking about now uh, this uh, Corona world application should actually kind of think about it that if they are, uh, if we are improving the situation awareness that they should take the privacy first approach. I believe there is a pull from the market for that yeah. and, and, and push yeah. away for the, for the sort of the, those that uh, overreach, at least in the Western world. And we see Google and Apple are, are following the trade, uh, the customer. I, I agree with you with the, the conclusions, but, uh, and with the logic, but I have some differences. And it, it tells that uh, when we are thinking about the emergence of the future, so whether we think that it, it is these large multinational companies, their decisions, or the nation states and their policies, or we can think that it's up to people, it's up to 
the way people think, how they perceive things and their values. And if their perceptions and values change, then also the logic of change changes. And that means that when people are, are thinking about the world or privacy or whatever, whatever are the important topics differently, so they will act differently and you would be fool not to listen to them. Yeah, I think there's also this really this sort of a special situation where okay, people are suffering simply from the situation. So, so the natural uh, way to behave is is just like just make it stop. I, I don't care, just make it stop, and 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 the, then that results in in various sorts of like knee jerk reactions where you forget forget about let's say like your values and principles and 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 simply decide okay we, we're just going to go past those just this once uh but but well it never stays there naturally so so i think that is also why, why it's it's really important to take a step back get rid of the sort of like emotional situation just consider okay these are the principles that we've agreed we still haven't changed our mind on that so how do we still solve the problem without sacrificing them. I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent point. It's an excellent point. And uh, I think the key, key there is really the, the recognizing that uh, even this all happened very fast, uh, it, it, it's not, uh, we are not sacrificing our values because if we do that, then you start to be on the slippery road. <laughs> If you Kara, I would like to ask you, uh, ask you, uh, because yeah. we, we are going to touch that question again about uh, privacy policies. But now when you, when you went to, uh, we are talking about, for example, Silo AI uh, and similar companies. What is, what is our role building these kind of solution technologies? And I would like to hear also uh, Mika's opinion about that. I think basically every every company has their their the values how they are, they are building and uh, and at the same time we are we are customer driven but I think uh, even this seminar that we are discussing and debating this is a one one element in that that we need to raise these topics because I don't think there are right answers uh, I raised this uh, contact tracing app uh, debate uh, there are actually if you go and check it out. Uh, uh, in a high level, you can say that there is a centralized world and there is a decentralized world, Google, Apple world and the government world. Uh, here is the freedom, here is the oversight or the surveillance. But it's not as simple as that, uh, that uh, when you start to look at the technical details and what can really happen if you, if you pass the, the token between two phones through Bluetooth. So, so, so this is like, they, we need these debates and discussions in order to raise the awareness that the, every line of code is actually uh, uh, part of your strategy and implementing your values. Yes. So how can we actually influence the thinking in the individual level when they are uh, designing the solutions? Yeah, to, to, to answer that, uh, you have a question and also to, to comment to Tero. I think that uh, even if it comes to uh, individuals, even if it comes to philosophers or researchers, I think our, our mission is to explain the world that we are, where we are living in the best way we can, then we can make the best solutions. And then, then, then also I think that what is, what is needed here is to raise the level of the intellectual or the national debate so that we will come with the better solutions and with the better choices. So I think that when you ask what, what's, what we can do as individuals or as a, as a small companies, I think that we can we can do a lot. How about Nico? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's really this sort of regular exploration that no matter this is again a problem that needs a solution, whether it's by the society or by the customers, but you probably don't know yet what is the right answer. So it really needs to try and fail first. And then then we're going to discover what is the right right way, for example, how, how Finland wants to approach this. Okay, Nicole, tell us a, a bit more about the privacy choices uh, made for the solution uh, you presented. And also, like generally speaking, does Silo have a privacy and ethics policy? And if so, 
what how 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 do we show it and i would like to hear also mika's opinion about is that would be that be a rightful or or, or is that the right opinion, uh, kind of thing to do uh, and whether it's a, a, a right or a wrong choice yeah so um usually whether it's the question is about security or it's about privacy it's it's something that is really hard to build into something later on uh, so unless you really take it into account when designing it from the start then you're lost so that's that's also why we really started considering this whole thing all the way in, in the beginning okay how do we do this in a privacy-minded way what are really the things that we have to take into account when designing this thing uh, and that is that is really the basis from which to which to start off over there. Uh, other than that, if you like considering uh, our business in general, so so there's quite a bit. We have a wide array of different types of customers, and many of them are providing rather critical data for us to actually analyze and build solutions based on that. And and naturally that is. That is, of course, like we're pretty proud that we've also actually built such a uh, business that we can be trusted with that sort of data. But it also becomes with quite a bit of responsibility to really secure it. So, so we do have, for example, we have like a, a list of all the data sets that we've received. Where are, where are we storing those? Who's responsible of that? Like who's responsible of the data on the customer side? And, and simply taking keeping tab on the data project protection question regarding that. So so yeah, yeah, my comment my comment here is that I think that every time a company or a person explicates and articulates its strategy in this time in, in, in connection with with, uh, with these uh, sensitive topics like privacy, I think it's a good starting point because then we can comment on that that strategy, and then we can improve it. And I think that the, the way forward is that when we start from here, then it becomes the question of our identity. Then we can make the real choices, who we are and who we aspire to be. But not without this. We have to articulate our position and our strategies, whether it's company-wise or nationwide, and then, then we can improve ourselves. And I think that this is this is the the momentum for this kind of work because the the, the world is, is is definitely changing. We are going someplace new, and this is a great opportunity to to rethink and and rediscuss our values, the the, the, the Finland we want to live in, or maybe the Europe we want to live in. My next question goes to all of you. Uh, if you think about uh, policy makers uh, versus uh, big companies such as Facebook, Google, uh, versus small companies like, for example, Silo, or even uh, just citizens who actually drives privacy. Was it too hard? Was it too general? No, <laughs> good question. Tero, do you want to say something? I, I think I, I think one element is that there's uh, this whole question of privacy is that we with our behavior we have defined it uh, it quite a lot so that we have uh, given our privacy in exchange for the right to use many applications that we use in our daily lives so it's 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 a price to pay for having an access to Facebook it's the price to pay to having access to Google Maps etc so you cannot get away with that and uh, we are happy to watch uh, it's actually not a new thing but uh, but we are happy to watch uh, advertising uh, in exchange for 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 giving some part of our privacy away uh, i think that therefore the the question is that it's a combination of the of the consumer desires and business models and and the society's value base if you look at europe I think we have the we have we have had the GDPR. We have had the privacy first kind of legislation, and and 
and value base. That has been great. We have consumers that are also willing to kind of are, are maybe more aware of this, this that they would like to keep their privacy, but we are lacking the business model uh, to monetize uh, many applications online. US, on the other hand, we have seen or US based companies in general who are dominating many of the sectors. They have actually designed their applications to use the our private information uh, that we uh, we have given consent to them to monetize the application. So they have the business model. They had originally maybe uh, this free market approach, but based on the discussion, and now we have seen that, that there has been a backslash and has had resulted in the certain corrections. So I think it comes back to that: Are we able to mobilize uh, enough consumers that take this seriously? Because many actually are not. And in this way, change the way how, how apps get designed and, and connect them with the, with the business model that works. I think it's, okay. it's also related to a question that privacy is simply really, really complex. It's really hard to understand what's going on with your data, what sort of yeah. data is being collected and what can be achieved with that data. So uh, often, uh, for example, when there's all sorts of data leaks happening, there's a big surprise from people that is this actually possible? Is this sort of data being actually collected from them? So in, in terms of such a complex issue, it's, it's a lot about public perception. So it's, it's not so much about the truth of privacy, but it's, it's about how do people perceive the situation? So the public opinion, how it's formed by, by everyone in all the different medias, including social media nowadays, that's, that's the thing that really determines our, our general stance uh, towards uh, privacy. So I think other than that, when considering governments and big, big companies, there's often this, this uh, situation where big companies can also use these situations to drive certain regulation, to stack the table for, for themselves because they are the only uh, parties involved who are actually able to invest sufficiently and, and build the necessary technology to uh, to fulfill a certain certain regulation that is a, something that needs to be minded when when building new regulation yeah yeah i think i think that uh, if you look uh, maybe maybe the last uh, 200 years so it used to be that the main discussion in the in the western democracies was how much the state should cover the citizens' life, and now we are in the 21st century. We are we are in in the, in the deep end. How much the technologies, whether we talk about artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever, how much or the algorithms, how much should they and are they governing and guiding people's life? So this, this has changed. The main topic has changed. And I think that there hasn't been enough discussion on this topic yet. Thanks. Uh, I have, I have, I have uh, more, more uh, questions about the uh, kind of the solution side and the product side. Uh, you know, people are pretty much always nowadays, you know, afraid about, you know, governments and big companies finding where they where, where they lure and uh, first of all nico for your for your presentation how is this your solution different from any other security surveillance for example in if you think about shopping malls you know there are surveillance cameras everywhere yeah uh and and that's also been something that has been a silent change. So there was never a questionnaire when you were entering the mall that is it okay that we are recurring uh, video data from what you are doing within the mall. It's, it simply happened without nobody asking anyone about it. And, and naturally, it's, it's still a, quite a bit of change. For example, a difference from, uh, from let's say, Chinese cities of London, where there's cameras everywhere on the streets as well. But, but surveillance is is pretty much part of the daily life in, let's say, uh, commercial spaces 
all over the place. Uh, and that is simply a necessary fact on, okay, how, how do we run these places uh, in, in a secure fashion? Uh, the difference naturally there is, okay, what is the nature of security surveillance? It's, it's often not even about tackling the issue right at that moment, but it's having a recording of that issue, something that you can get back to, something you can provide to the police and they can investigate the issue based on that. Uh, so it's, it's first of all, it's about identifying individual people over there, identifying what they are doing and recording all of that for long-term storage until you can be sure that there's nothing useful left in that data set. Uh, so compared to this solution where we are not really necessarily interested in the identities of the people, it's simply about understanding what is the status of the space, of the premises as such. So how many people are moving there? Uh, what sort of age groups are they there? Uh, where are they forming uh, big bottleneck groups that need to be tackled by redesigning that piece of the space, for example. So none of that is needing any kind of identifiable information. Those could be just as well dogs walking around in the space. It's, uh, it's, it's not really a question of who is the person there. It's simply that there is a person uh, in general form. And, and that is the key piece over there. Uh, second of all, when it comes to the storage of the data, so uh, for these purposes, we are not needing to store the video data as such for, for any purposes. We can simply convert that into statistics, into numbers, and, uh, and then throw away the more compl complicated, in terms of privacy, more complicated, uh, video data and simply work with these fully anonymized numbers. For example, what was the number of people within this 10 square meter area at five o'clock this afternoon? Uh, unfortunately, time is running pretty quickly. I have still one more question before we jump into the questions of the audience. Uh, you all uh, work in the field uh, where, where there's a lot of fuss going on in the world today and you know a lot of people a lot of people know you and uh, artificial intelligence always is sometimes attached to uh, robots and and things that uh, are still yeah pretty far from uh, from the average joe as 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 uh, for example i am so you have to answer a uh, people a lot about you know worried consumers for example how would you explain the unintended use of these kind of solutions, uh, technologies, and, and consequences to clients and to average shows? Yeah. Yes. I think that, that is an excellent question because I think that uh, uh, the, the, the media or the publicity is, is very often there that we have all kinds of uh, manifestations of the novel technologies, etc. And there's less discussion about the consequences. And it's more difficult to make those kind of conclusions, whether they are social or legal or, or whatever. And I think that this kind of uh, discussion is, is greatly needed. And then also back to, back to Nico's, Nico's previous comment. So I think that uh, the main issue here is that uh, when you are aware of the capabilities of these novel technologies. The second question is, according to which mental models or value base are you applying them? And that, that makes a huge difference. It, it, it is the difference, or it should be the difference between, between Europe and between China, between Europe and between US. So if, if, we, if we are really careful, if we, are, if we, if we follow uh, the light, the, 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 the identity who we are, and apply these, these issues in, in goodwill. So I think that that will be, uh, that will prove to be our benefit in the future. And it, it's, it's also that the, it will be the world that we are building, that I would like to live in, and I would like to have my boy live in. So I think that uh, this is a question of, of 
of, of life and death. So how we apply these, these capabilities that Nico, Nico described earlier. I think maybe... I think, uh, do you want to go first? Maybe you can conclude then, Nico. So I was just going to say that uh, the technology is very often uh, the adoption curve is that when you uh, when you exceed the so-called critical mass, somebody becomes an acceptable behavior. Then then you have either either got it or you have lost it the, the game, because uh, then there is no turning back. Uh, nobody is anymore navigating without the navigator. Uh, yeah. Google Maps, which it is currently, nobody. Actually, the Corona crisis have uh, have. Uh, thought us everybody to use uh, these uh, video conferencing facilities so we are not we might be worried about that our all our actions are being monitored and recorded through this but actually we don't care anymore because the, yeah. it's uh, acceptable behavior and those who didn't use it uh, they now must use and they have maybe started to enjoy to use them so in that sense i think that before you exceed the critical mass you can still do something about it and when we are designing this solution, I think the principles that Nico was showing in these solutions are kind of quite simple. And, and uh, you, you could design the application in a very different way where you would overreach to the data and et cetera. But, but I think that uh, if you start from the right angle and when you exceed the critical mass, then you are on a good path. I think this, those were really good questions. I mentioned you also Mika, you said, and I think the biggest cure for all sorts of illnesses is it's, it's often sunlight. So it's about being open and transparent of, of what's really happening with the data. Uh, and uh, and I think for that reason, the EU guidelines was also a pretty good starting point for how to use AI. So they came up with these seven principles, starting, let's say, from human agency. There's things like diversity, transparency, and so on in there. And, and from those, you could basically form uh, traffic lights of seven different shapes of, okay, what is the risk level in this aspect for this specific solution? How does it actually manifest in this solution? And that, that is the way that we could build solutions where the privacy risk can actually be understood by everyone like really force businesses to describe things in a language that is accessible to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And now I think we have some time left for a few audi uh, audience questions, as we promised. Uh, first, the question goes more to Nico. Uh, Munira is asking, um, how do we identify persons with higher risk? Um, that is actually not a, a simple thing. So, so as you know, for this current pandemic, it, it hits people in different manners based on various things. Some of, some of them are very uh, things that you can't, can't really see in any way. So if you have a previous illness, then you are at higher risk. And that is simply impossible to detect based on camera data. And I think that is a very good thing, actually, for, for the society in general. But some things you can detect from the camera data. So uh, to an extent, you can detect the age group of people in a video feed. You can also detect if they're using, for example, personal masks that reduce the contagion to, to others, possibly. So um, it's, a, it's always statistics it's about probabilities how well do we detect these things but at the same time we are not looking for individual detections we are simply looking to understand the statistical situation in the spaces so as long as we are hitting the mark there then uh, the results are ne nevertheless useful thank you and the next question goes uh, is from minna and it goes firstly to Nico and then uh, to Terro and Mika as well. Uh, what kind of research have you done about the real life, real life needs and effects of these kind of concepts on both the potential clients and potential affected citizens? And is there any evidence, for example, that people feel more safe 
as the result as you thought they might? It, yeah, so um, if we start from the premise that we had for building this solution is that business need, businesses need to be able to systematically improve their situation also, also in this aspect going forward. So they need data to achieve that. And uh, what we've built is, is the tool with which this new data is suddenly available to the businesses, but how to actually turn that new information into actions that improve safety. That is still the question of, of how do we work together with the business? How, how do we work together with the customer to, to discover new ways to, to change the situation in, in their own premises? So maybe Tero here uh, are still adding to that one that I, I think this is actually a, a hard question as such because the, because the, uh, if we take an example that that uh, that any like a mall when Nico was earlier mentioning that okay nobody asked the question but actually we give our concept by entering the premises to the, that we are being surveyed by the cameras today that's a that's a reality and by law there needs to be a sign that you are being surveyed but and and I think uh, I'm not sure but I believe that Helsinki city is surveying us on the streets uh, because they are recording public premises so if one would now say that uh, hey these uh, cameras are being used for some other purpose however that might be designed it might cause some implications that some people don't like it and and or 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 refuse to go to the specific place or or there might be even protests so we might not not uh, predict the react but that's why i think that every time we launch a new technical solution we should actually comply with what Nico outlined in his previous uh, answer about those principles that how the design is being done and we are very transparent and that will help to alleviate the fears because actually before taking into use it's hard to predict what the outcome is and how people really will really react but if we have a good purpose we have a clear principles how we design and we are transparent I think we are already on a much better path I would like to continue from that. The same question uh, to Mikko. Uh, it's not about our research, is it? Uh, who is actually running the research, uh, like in general? Is it, uh, do the companies, uh, the big players as, as we spoke, are the ones who are actually running, uh, running the show also from the research side and actually, you know, building up these kind of expectations uh, that uh, the public and the worried citizens are just uh, uh, forced to uh, implement in their lives. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that these these are the are the are the major questions. So, so I, I I give you one example. So, so for a long time, Shell was the leading scenario company when it came to 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 energy. And one of the purpose, because I, I have worked a long time with the cell scenario planner, was not only to make the scenarios, but also to guide the world towards a certain direction. And because of the scenarios were so good, so also the second purpose of doing these kinds of research was fulfilled. And uh, in businesses, we have started to talk about thought leadership, and we have major companies and they are all, they have teams or whatever, they have things that, that aim at thought leadership. And then when it can come to, to, to US, which I know pretty well, I think one, one of the non-Americans who knows the modus operandi in, in, in US very well. So that means that the whole uh, connection when it comes to it used to it used to be research now it's data management it used to be also total information awareness and those kind of topics have been one of the reasons why us has been able to guide the global agenda 
and I think that this is this is a very very important topic and I think that uh, what we are doing here in Finland when it comes to this level of research is that uh, this is really like a catch-22 so I think that uh, the whole modus operandi what we are doing in in Finland or in European Union is 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 too slow, too manual, too academic to get the global leadership when it comes to thinking and when it comes to innovation. I mean, this has been really, really interesting uh, fireside chat. I mean, we are only missing the actual fireside. Uh, I think uh, with with you guys, this this uh, talk could go on and on. Unfortunately, the time is uh, time is up. And uh, I would like to thank the audience for the questions. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to cover them all, all up. And uh, of course, I want to thank Mika, Terra and Nico for your participation. Uh, thank you very much. It's been really an honor to hear you and your opinions. And as I said, I want to thank also the audience and, uh, and just make sure that you have signed up for the, also for the upcoming webinars, the next one. AI in a smart industry is coming up uh, June 24th. Thank you. Hope to see you again and have a great week, you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Take care.